Daniel Batanu, and he's going to walk us through uh, self-encrypting drives, and, or sorry, bypassing self-encrypted drives techniques, and uh, I'm looking forward to this one myself, I must say. So with that, thank you. Sure, thank you. We're actually going to look at self-encrypting drives as well and see how they work. Um, just before we start, so I'm Daniel Botano. I work with uh, KPMG Canada in the forensic technology team. Um, I started my background in information security by first trying to see how I can build secure things and how I can deploy secure things. And after a certain while, I got bored of that and I said, hmm, it seems like it's more fun to break them. So I went a bit into the pen test side and application security testing and code review and, and all of that stuff. And that was fun, but after a certain time, I got bored of that. And I said, let me move on to something else. So I put the forensic investigator hat, and this is my main job right now, where I'm actually looking at things that bad guys do and try to understand what they did and how we can catch them. Um, and I have a bunch of certs uh, in each of these fields, but what I'm really passionate about is uh, some security research, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, B-Sides was an amazing event. We still have a couple of talks before it's over. If you're looking for your next conference, there's one coming up in Montreal. It's called NorthSec. They have an awesome CTF. Uh, I highly suggest that you check them out. Okay, so let's get into the self-encrypting drives. Um, first of all, by a show of hands, who here is using uh, full disk encryption on their laptops? Okay, a fair amount. Um, keep your hands up for those that are using hardware-based encryption. Okay, that's still maybe a quarter of everybody that has had their hands up. Who here isn't sure if it's software-based or hardware-based? So today we're going to see, hopefully help you understand if, it, if you're using software-based encryption or hardware-based encryption. And then for the hardware-based ones, we're going to see some flaws that are inherent with the way standards are built uh, that will allow you to break that encryption. So the software-based encryption, the way it works is the classical full disk encryption. It's that there's a module usually in the operating system that does the encryption and the decryption for you. Um, the advantages of software-based encryption is that it works on any piece of hardware. It doesn't matter if you have a Lenovo laptop, a Dell laptop, an HP, a Samsung drive, a Western Digital, it works on everything. It's software that does it. If, if it runs software, if your computer runs software, which it does, it's gonna do software-based encryption. Uh, the applications don't really know that you have uh, hardware uh, or software encryption. So your Microsoft Word is not gonna know that your hard drive is encrypted. It's just gonna know that it's writing a file and then the operating system is hand handling everything in the background. Um, it has some disadvantages, the software-based encryption. Uh, it's slow if you want to encrypt the drive. So let's say you have a laptop. For those of you that haven't raised your hand uh, and your laptop's not encrypted, you should definitely consider encrypting it because if somebody gets a hold of it, even if, if, even if you have a password, they can read your data. So let's say you want to put TrueCrypt on it, uh, although nobody's using TrueCrypt anymore now, right? <laughs> So it takes a while for the software to read all of the data, encrypt it, and then write it in an encrypted form on the disk. And if we look at the way a software-based encryption works, when you power on your computer, um, what we have here on the left um, is the drive. So whether this is a hard drive or an SSD, uh, this is what I'm, 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 I'm showing in this part here. And then at the right is your computer. So imagine these as two different components. The, we're looking at the drive in a bit more detail, the drive that's inside your computer. So this drive actually has on the, on the drive, there's two areas. There's the pre-boot area, which is in blue, which means that it's not encrypted. And then there's, there's the user data, which is encrypted. So all of your operating system actually lives in the user data in the encrypted part. So when you're powering on the machine, what happens is the pre-boot software will get loaded, and that software is unencrypted, so it will just travel through the SATA interface. And then at some point you will authenticate. There's a module that will be created on your computer, the software decryption layer. Um, and then this module will decrypt all of the other data and assist with the, uh, the boot process of the operating system. And then through the rest of the usage of the hard drive, uh, the data will be read encrypted from the hard drive, will travel through the SATA interface encrypted, and then this module will decrypt it before presenting it to the operating system. 
So this was software. Now we're moving on to hardware. This is why we're here. This is what we're interested in. So hardware-based encryption is different in the sense that it's not the operating system. It's not a software module in the operating system that does the encryption anymore. It's actually a hardware component on the hard drive itself. And it has a couple of advantages. Uh, one of them is it doesn't have any performance overhead. You, you don't, you're not using any CPU cycles to do the encryption. The drive does it for you. Another pretty good big advantage is if you want to encrypt your drive, it's just instant encryption. You just change a switch and your hard drive is instantly encrypted. And we're going to see in a second how that works and how that's possible. So for the hardware-based encryption, this is transparent both for the applications but also for the operating system. Your Windows is not going to know that your hard drive is encrypted. It will just boot just as if it was a standard operating system and from a standard hard drive. So there's a few requirements for a hardware-based encryption. You must have a compatible motherboard, so any modern new laptop will typically do, a drive that supports the required standards, and you'll need a software or a management component to manage this. And if you look at it on paper, uh, hardware-based encryption doesn't have any disadvantage. I, I don't know why we're, we're still using some of us uh, software-based encryption, and, and that's how it's being advertised. So going back to our diagram where we have the drive on the left and then the computer on the right, um, if this drive is a software uh, self-encrypting drives uh, drive, said or uh, self-encrypting drive, there will be once again some system data, and then all of the user data is once again encrypted. Only that this time, the user data which is encrypted goes to a crypto processor which is on the drive. This crypto processor will decrypt the data and will send the data back through the SATA interface to the computer in an unencrypted form. So the computer receives unencrypted data the, through, the, through the SATA channel. And then usually there's a management component, a software in the operating system that sends commands to this drive through the SATA protocol. And these are, that's what, what the black line here uh, means. Now there's a couple of variations of self-encrypting drives and uh, just to make sure that we get the naming right uh, because the term is used for, for a couple of cases. Uh, first there was the ATA security mode and this isn't really used a lot, especially not in enterprises. Um, it's the drive does the encryption. It's exactly what we've seen here. It's just that it's controlled by the BIOS. When you power on your computer, the BIOS prompts you for a password. You type in the password and that, that password unlocks all of the process. And it's not really used because it's difficult to manage. You have to manage the BIOS. It's not a software that can be handled through GPOs or through some other enterprise management uh, modules. What we're interested in is the OPAL standard, and this is a, a standard that was created by the Trusted Computing Group. It's the same group that set the standards for the TPM, another security module in the computer. So the OPAL group created uh, a new standard, uh, the OPAL standard, and all of the hard drives that are OPAL compliant will work with this standard. So th they made this to make sure that uh, if you have a Lenovo laptop and a Samsung drive or a Dell laptop and a Seagate drive or some other combination, they will, they will work. It's not something proprietary to just a, a manufacturer. But you still need a software component that will manage this. So in the operating system, you will have something that uh, will send commands to the drive and tell the drive how to set the keys or uh, activate encryption or deactivate encryption. It's just that it's the drive that's actually doing that work. There is a pre-boot authentication as well in most cases, uh, and that's available through a process called MBR shadowing, and we're going to see that in a second as well. And the data is always encrypted on these drives. As soon as a, a self-encrypting drive or a SED leaves the factory, the data on it is encrypted. Whether you're using it uh, as a SED or not, you might have a SED on your, in your computer, actually not know that it's a SED or that it's Opal compliant, uh, and have the data encrypted. It's just that the way this works is the data is encrypted with a media encryption key, and then this media encryption key is encrypted with another key, which is called the key encryption key, and the encrypted version of the media encryption key is stored on the drive, and then the key encryption key is not stored anywhere. This is derived from the user password or the management software that unlocks the drive. So the drive is encrypted when it leaves the factory. It's just that the key encryption key, the key that unlocks the drive, is just typically set to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And if you want to activate encryption of the drive, you just need to send the drive a command. It's going to put a random key instead, and all of a sudden, all of your data will be encrypted with a, with a key chain that uh, you more or less control. 
Microsoft looked at this, this and said, this is interesting. We like the Opal standard, but we want to have a couple of requirements on top of that. So they added that. And BitLocker can actually manage self-encrypting drives. And Microsoft calls this eDrive in their documentation. Uh, but if you look at it in Windows, it's just BitLocker. So if you thought that BitLocker just does software encryption, it's actually not the, not the case. BitLocker can actually manage hardware uh, encrypted drives, and we're going to see that in, in demos here. And then there's another category that's outside of the scope of this talk, is all of the custom implementations. For example, the Western Digital USB hard drives that do this type of encryption. Uh, there's modules on the drive that do the encryption, but it's a custom proprietary protocol and the way it works is not governed by the Opal standard. Or the USB thumb drives that have some software that triggers the encryption or something similar to that. We're not going to look into that. And each of those are custom to that specific implementation. And what we see in enterprises is that typically SEDs are deployed uh, in the Opal configuration. And whether that's Opal or eDrive, we're not really, we don't really care. I'm going to use the terms to describe both. Um, the BIOS of the computer is locked sometimes. Most of the times it's just open. You can just go in there and make any changes that you want. Uh, and usually you're allowed to, a computer can be on or off or anywhere in between. It can be in a hibernation state or it can be in a sleep state. Uh, whenever you're closing the lid to your laptop, laptop go to sleep, you change meeting rooms, you open the lid, laptop wakes from sleep, uh, manager is happy. We're going to look into the detail of how uh, the drives get locked and unlocked now, this, the self-encrypting drives. So when the drive is off, when there's no power to the drive, obviously the drive is locked. The key encryption key, the, the key that allows the unlocking of all of the process and the reading of the data and that allows the crypto module on the drive to decrypt the data, is not present anywhere on the drive. So the drive is in a locked state. And whenever you power off the drive, that key will disappear from the drive controller's memory, so the drive will always go back to a lock state when you power it off. When you power on the drive, the drive still doesn't have that key, so it's not able to uh, read the data. The processor on the drive is not able to read the data. But what the drive will do is it will expose an area which contains the pre-boot authentication software, and it exposes this area in a read-only mode. So if you take a drive, you plug it in into a, a SATA to USB adapter, you're going to be able to read the pre-boot authentication, but even if you try to write it or, 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 or tamper with it or put a, a backdoor in there, you're not going to be able to. The drive's read-only. It's not going to allow you to do that. So what happens is that the computer, uh, when you try to boot it, it will read that pre-boot authentication. It usually prompts the user for credentials or interacts with the TPM in some way, extracts uh, a, a password or a key that it sends to the drive, and then with that key or that password, the drive decrypts the key encryption key, and with that it decrypts the media encryption key and then keeps that in the memory of the crypto processor so then the crypto processor will be able to encrypt and decrypt data transparently. So this is the on and unlocked state. And one very important thing to remember is that once a drive is in an on and unlocked state, the drive will remain in that state until somebody tells the drive you need to be locked again or until you remove power for the, from the drive. So what that typically means is that, let's say if you restart uh, your operating system, the drive will still remain unlocked. The operating system doesn't really know that the drive is locked, so it doesn't do anything special with it. Um, if you crash your computer, the drive will remain unlocked. Uh, that, that key will still remain in the memory of the drive. And this is actually something that the standard specifies, that Opal specifies. This is how drives are supposed to work. And this is what we're going to exploit uh, to be able to gain access to the data. Before I show you how to break self-encrypting drives, um, I just want to make sure that uh, for those of you that don't have a setup with a, a self-encrypting drive, you have the steps required to configure one. So that after this talk, you can go at home and actually configure your drive to be in this mode and do some of the testing yourself. So you're going to see it's pretty easy to set it up this way. Um, I'm going to show you how to do it with uh, Windows, uh, with BitLocker. There's a lot of other management software that can do this. There's WinMagic, there's uh, a secure doc, there's McAfee, there's Symantec, there's all of the software that handles uh, hard drive encryption, pretty much ha handles self-encrypting drives. You need a drive that support, supports the Opal standard and the mo uh, a modern laptop. So, 
if you're unsure what the state of your drive is right now, uh, and you're using BitLocker, or you, you're, you're thinking that you might be using BitLocker, you can run the manage-bde command with the dash status to ask BitLocker to tell you the status of the encryption. So if you get the message fully decrypted, it means that you don't have any encryption on the drive, at least not with BitLocker. You might have some other solution that's doing encryption, but you don't have any BitLocker there. So if you're trying to configure a drive to have encryption, this is a good place to start. If you run the same command, but you get the conversion status fully encrypted, and then the encryption method is AES-128, it means that you have software-based encryption. And then if you get the message hardware encryption in there, it means that you have hardware encryption. So you're gonna be able to use this command just to make sure to see that when you're activating encryption, it actually goes into a hardware mode. So the steps to activate encryption are actually the following. First, you need to make sure that your BIOS or UEFI is configured with secure boot mode on. Why? Because Microsoft said that that's a requirement. If you wanna have a BitLocker self-encrypting drive, you have to have this because this protects you against other things and Microsoft wants you to be secure. Second, you need to prepare your Windows installation ISO on a FAT32 formatted USB thumb drive or on a CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, if anybody still has those laying around. Uh, the reason for this is that the Windows installer uh, in UEFI boot mode doesn't really behave nicely from NTFS drives, which is surprising because Microsoft invented NTFS. During the installation process, uh, you just need to run the clean command in disk part. What this does is it will wipe everything there's on that drive. So if you have data there, this would be a good moment to stop. Um, it also sends the commands required to initialize the encryption key. So disk part does that under the hood, even though you're not, you might not suspect that it does that. And then once you have Windows installed, you just go to the manage BitLocker and turn on BitLocker and you're gonna have a, a hardware encrypted drive and then you can use the manage BD command to check that that's the case. So the reason I started looking at the self-encrypted drives is that I was doing forensic investigations and then you have to uh, create images of these drives uh, and you run into challenges. So I'm gonna show you what happens if you try to connect these drives, the self-encrypting drives, to some of the hardware uh, imagers. Uh, so these are devices where you plug, plug in a drive, it will create an image of that drive to another repository. So the Tableau TD2U, TD3, these are pretty, pretty popular. Um, they have an option actually where they can say if there's any security in use, they pretty much look at just the ATA security mode. They're not gonna see that the drive's encrypted if it has hardware encryption. And there's some cases where they're just gonna go happily and, and, and image that drive at very fast speeds. Um, the Logic Cube Falcon, which is another hardware device that can do imaging of hard drives, uh, doesn't see encryption either because it also looks at the ATA security mode. Um, but then in some cases it fails right away after you, 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 you start imaging. Um, if you connect the drive to a, a Linux distribution and you're trying to do the imaging that way, this is a custom uh, Ubuntu-based uh, uh, Linux imaging distribution, uh, there are some cases in which the device file will just not be present. The drive that we were expecting here would have been SDA Dev 4, and it's not even there. You're not, uh, if you try to image it, uh, you're just gonna get some errors with DD. Uh, there's other cases where you will see a, a, a file there, a device file, but it's pretty huge. This one is 15 exabytes. An exabyte is one million terabytes. So um, good luck imaging that. Sometimes the imaging software will work. DD will say, yeah, I can start uh, crunching on that. It's gonna take a, a lot of space to image it um, and uh, it's gonna try to work. But we'll see in a second that if you take that image after and you connect it to some uh, forensic software, so we're showing here NCASE, NCASE is able to handle uh, a couple of software encryption uh, uh, solutions out there. And if you provide it with the key, it will be able to decrypt the data and show you the actual data. In this case, with the hardware encrypting drives, NCASE will look at the drive and say, hmm, this has the pattern of BitLocker or it has the pattern of secure doc. If you give me the key, I will be able to decrypt it from the image that you gave me. Uh, no matter how hard you try, uh, NCASE is just gonna come back and say, hmm, there's an error I wasn't able to decrypt. And if you actually look at your image, you're gonna see that it has all zeros after the pre-boot part. So it doesn't take a forensic investigator to know that there's no data behind that. Uh, if you have that in your image, you're not gonna recover anything. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. How do we bypass uh, self-encrypting drives? 
Like I mentioned before, the techniques to bypass self-encrypting drives are not something that are specific to a, a, a certain uh, laptop manufacturer uh, or a certain drive manufacturer or a certain software. It's just the way the standard is made and everybody that implements the standard is going to work that way. There's things that can be done uh, to mitigate some of the risks and we're going to see that uh, a, a bit later, uh, but it pretty much works on anything that implements this. And, and I tested on a couple of configurations. So we're going to see uh, five different scenarios uh, of attacks that can be used to bypass these drives, depending on the state in which the drive is and how far you want to push that machine or how far you want to push that drive. Okay, so the hot plug attack, uh, in the case where you have pass-through preboot. What does pass-through preboot means? In the case of BitLocker, for example, you can have it configured so that when you power on your machine, the TPM, authenticates the bootloader, makes sure that the drive is the same drive and it's running in the same machine. If you move that drive somewhere else, the TPM is not gonna release the key for another, another drive. If you change some BIOS configurations, the TPM is not gonna release the key. If you change the bootloader, the TPM is not gonna release the key. So uh, for the user, the user will just power on the drive, the, 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 sorry, the machine, and it will go straight through to Windows. TPM is doing all the work. So if this is the case, the steps that we will do to attack this scenario is um, we will install SATA data and power extension cables and uh, the demo's coming in, in 30 seconds. We'll just power on the laptop. At that point when, you, when we power on the laptop, the drive will turn on, but it will still be in a locked state. Then the pre-boot authentication software loads and then transparently talks to the TPM, asks the TPM nicely to release the encryption key, the TPM releases the keys which are sent to the drive and the drive unlocks itself and keeps a copy of the media encry encryption key in memory. So at that point the drive becomes on and unlocked and then the pre-boot software will just trigger a standard boot from that point on so then the Windows bootloader will load and start loading Windows and everything behind it. And the drive will remain in an on unlock state. So what we will do is after Windows starts or after at least this first process of unlocking the drive is complete, we'll simply switch the SATA data cable. So instead of it being connected to the laptop uh, where it, uh, the drive originally was, we're just going to plug it into an attacker control machine. Simple as that. Okay, so uh, let's see. We have a camera here, so you can see a bit better what's happening. So first I'm just gonna show you how the laptop works. I'm gonna power on this laptop. So there we go, it's on, it's a Windows 10. We have a, a user here, Anne. Um, let's see what the, if any updates were applied recently to this machine. Um, yeah, it turns out that this is the Windows 10 uh, updated as of today. So all's good, we have all the latest patches. And then let's see the status of the drive. Let's see if the drive is encrypted or not. So we're gonna run the manage bds dash status command. So this is where we see that the drive is fully encrypted and then encryption type is hardware encryption. So the drive is indeed encrypted. Key protectors here uh, shows TPM, which means that we only need the TPM to unlock the drive. We don't need to enter a pin when we're booting the laptop to unlock the drive. And then there's a second option, numerical password. This is actually the BitLocker recovery key. In case you uh, lose uh, access to the TPM or something happens and you need to recover data on the drive, you can supply it with a numerical password as well and unlock the drive. And another thing you can use to, uh, just to see if the drive's encrypted or not, Windows shows you an icon near the drive. Uh, you see the padlock here. Uh, the padlock's unlocked. Uh, if it's a, a hardware-based encryption, that means that the drive's encrypted, but in an unlocked state. If it's software, you're gonna see the padlock, usually in yellow, and it's gonna show always locked. And we have a file here on the desktop, and this is the file that we're gonna try to read uh, from the other computer. So now the user goes home, the user will do a shutdown. Uh, 
so it's a full shutdown. It's, the computer doesn't even go to sleep. We're, we're, we're taking all of the precautions. We don't want to have the, the, the key in memory or anywhere else uh, so that we, uh, the key could be recovered. The computer is shut down. Uh, the attacker steals the laptop. The attacker will open the laptop, and you'll see how easy it is to open one of these laptops. Well, it's actually not that easy. I had all of the screws undone before. <laughs> We might need the battery. The battery is actually here, and the laptop is not going to power on if we don't put the battery back in. So this is where my SSD is. I'm just going to remove it from here. This is just the Velcro instead of screws. And I'm connecting this uh, SATA extension cable just so that I can work with the drive outside of the laptop. and I'm going to put some tape so that the cable stays there. Okay, let me put the battery back in as well. And tape that as well. Okay. So now I have the drive right here. And what I'm going to do is, with this cable that I have on the laptop, I'm going to connect the data cable to this extension, and then the data cable will go in the hard drive. So this is the setup that I have. And I need to provide my drive with some power as well, so I just have another an external uh, power adapter here. And I'm providing the drive with some uh, SATA power so that if my laptop uh, restarts or crashes or anything happens with it, uh, it's not going to be a problem. I'm, I'm not going to lose uh, power to the drive, and the, the drive's not going to unlock itself. So we're just going to power on the laptop now. The laptop powers on from off mode. The TPM will uh, just see that nothing changed since last time. It will unlock the drive. It was a very fast boot. This is Windows 10. So now I will remove the data cable. Oh, my camera crashed. Sorry. OK. So now I will remove the data cable from the, uh, that goes in, into the laptop. And pretty surely the laptop will crash. <laughs> we don't need this anymore. We have the drive right here. And I will connect the drive to a USB uh, to set an adapter. The cables are pretty short, so I'm not going to be able to show it real well on the camera. So I just connected this here. And now I should see in this computer, pop, the drive just popped up, the victim drive. And now I just can go into the users, and I can read the drive just as if that drive uh, wasn't encrypted at all. So what Windows is saying and Microsoft is saying whoa, is uh, TPM uh, is good, it's nice, but if you really want a secure deployment, you should have a TPM and a PIN. So that's the case where you have a pre-boot authentication. Um, this is the technique to bypass this is something that was known for ATA security uh, drives. Um, and it only works if the laptop is in sleep mode or if the laptop is on. So basically what we will do is, if the laptop is on, we'll just put the laptop in sleep mode. Then when the laptop's in sleep mode, we will install the extension cables again. And then we'll just resume from sleep or wake from sleep to have the laptop unlock the drive. And then when the drive is unlocked, we'll just switch the SATA data connection from the laptop to our actual computer. So pretty much simple as that. And we'll have access to the drive as well. Another technique is the forced restart attack. Um, so if we have this in a pass-through pre-boot authentication again, so that means when we power on the laptop, TPM automatically unlocks it. Um, it. The steps that we can do is we'll just power on the laptop so that the machine starts. Uh, we'll wait for the management software to unlock it, and then we'll find a way to crash the machine. And when you crash the machine, what happens is that the machine will restart, but the drive will remain unlocked. 
So if you boot from something else, you'll still be able to read the data on the drive. And this works except for uh, drives in the E drive mode on Lenovo laptops. Lenovo put in some mitigations, and if they detect this, they're actually going to reset the drive uh, when it reboots. If there's, there is a pre-boot authentication, uh, so you have to type in a PIN or username and password when you're starting the computer, um, then you need to have the laptop in sleep mode or uh, on again. If the laptop is in sleep mode, we'll just wake it up. We're, we're going to trigger a soft reset, and then we're just going to boot from an alternative source. Uh, so it's as simple as that. Once again, this doesn't work with the Lenovo laptops in eDrive mode. So you might ask, how are we going to trigger a, a soft reset uh, of the machine? Well, one way is to crash it, and you can crash it with uh, fuzzing the USB. Uh, it turns out that uh, the USB stack, at least until Windows 10, uh, can crash pretty easily. Uh, there's actually a command here for UMAP, which is the tool that you can use to drive uh, the Face Dancer, which crashes all versions of Windows until Windows 10. Um, there's test cases there in UMAP that can still crash a Windows 10 if you know how to run them. Uh, so uh, it's pretty easy to crash a fully patched Windows 10. Some other techniques, if you really like hardware and you like to play with fire, uh, is just take a screwdriver and uh, just slide it on top of the pins of the memory dim. Uh, <laughs> You might break something, uh, or you can just remove one of the memory dims uh, while the computer is running. In my experience, this works maybe half of the times. Uh, half of the times, the computer will restart uh, and will trigger a soft reset, and then you'll be able to do the attack that you want. Half of the, the other half of the times, when you play with the memory, uh, the computer will just freeze. Uh, and then after a certain time, the motherboard will detect that there's a problem and trigger a hard reset, which will reset the drive as well, so you won't be able to access it that way. So this is a 50-50. A, a and then finally, the last technique, uh, the hot unplug attack um, that I'm going to talk about today, this is similar to the hot plug attack. It's just that it's on steroids. So um, if you have something that detects when you're taking the drive out of the laptop and you're resuming from sleep and tries to prevent that, you can use the hot unplug attack. So the hot unplug attack, um, you need to have the laptop on, or if it's in sleep mode, wake it up. Or if it's off and uses the pass-through authentication, just power it on so that it's on. And then you're going to expose the uh, SATA pins. So this is the lap, a, a drive in the, the, the drive compartment. You just undo the screw in this case and slightly pull it over. The drive is still connected. It's still power on. It's still unlocked. But you have access to the pins. Then you're going to force supply power to the drive while it's in the laptop. So you're going to bring power from another source and connect it there. So the way I did this is I just took a SATA uh, extension cable. Uh, I broke all the plastic off, so I exposed the pins. And then you can connect those pins to the drive. Uh, be careful with this. <laughs> and once you have that, you remove the drive from the laptop while maintaining the, the, the cable with the pins there. And then you connect the other end of that cable to the attacker machine. So you'll end up with the drive sitting on the table and with you holding that connector while your buddy is reading data uh, and, and actually operating the other machine. So I don't know if you noticed, but this photo is different than this photo. It's another drive. Uh, that's because when I was doing this, one of the times I actually moved the connector slightly. So I provided power on pins that weren't actually expanding that much voltage and power. So pretty much fried the drive. So uh, be careful with this. And I think we have time for a, an, another demo. Uh, let me just take another laptop. We have a laptop here that is, um, it, it uses, uses secure dock. Let me just turn on the camera. So this one uses pre-boot authentication. So
So this is the legitimate user that just powers on the machine. Uh, at this point, at this point, the drive became unlocked. Now Windows is starting. And what I'm going to show you is that after Windows started, uh, we're going to crash the machine. Now, typically, I would crash this with the USB phase dancer. Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit tricky with the cables, and I don't have long enough cables to do that. Uh, but while you're testing, a very uh, useful technique to see if you're uh, vulnerable to these type of attacks, if you can crash a machine, is actually to trigger a crash dump from Windows. And there's, it's a documented way. If you have admin privileges on the machine, you can actually set some registry keys that will tell Windows to crash if something happens, uh, if you press these keys. So here my user just locks the machine. I'm going to press my secret key combination. And the machine crashed. And now I'm quickly going to boot from another device. I plugged in a USB thumb drive. I'm going to boot from that. Uh, seems like I wasn't fast enough. So this just might just be a fail. Let's just try to control all deletes. Try again. Ah, there we go. So I'm booting from a USB device. And now I'm booting an Ubuntu. But during all this time, if everything went well, uh, the drive remained in an unlocked state. So right now, the drive is unlocked. When my Ubuntu starts, it's just going to see a drive that's unlocked. So we're just going to, we're just going to confirm that. So yeah, the, the, the Windows uh, crash dump, the, which is usually control scroll lock scroll lock by the default configuration, um, is, is, is nice if you're, if you know that you can crash it with the phase dancer, uh, but you don't always want to use that or you think, well, maybe everything that was known, all of the, the, the crash, uh, test cases are patched, but there might be others in the future. You just want to know if, uh, if there are, are other cases in the future that can easily crash the machine, will you still be vulnerable to this? You can actually use the documented way for, uh, in Windows to crash it. So let's just start a terminal. Where do I change the font size? So this is, oh, my camera crashed again. You know this is a good demo when it crashes a couple of times, right? So I just ran uh, LS block, uh, and I can see my SDA1 and SDA2. Uh, and in this case, SDA, SDA1 has a size of 238 gigabytes, which uh, is the size that I was expecting. Actually, let's mount the drive. And let's mount it read-only. And there we go. We can read the contents of the drive, even, even though the drive is encrypted, without actually taking the drive out of the machine. Okay, so remember when I told you at the beginning that this is what's going to be the agenda, this is what we're, we're going to talk about? Uh, actually, I lied. There's two more points. <laughs> there's uh, detection mitigation, and then there's homework for you. So yes, this is actually one of those talks that gives you homework. Um, if we look at detection, let's say you're suspecting that somebody in your organization uh, used one of these techniques to read data from the CEO's laptop or for, from somebody from, from a VIP. And you're actually given the laptop after and you're asked to investigate that. Uh, it turns out that it's really difficult to tell that if, if, if that happened or not. Uh, if somebody used the hot plug or hot unplug attacks, the only traces that will remain on the laptop are traces that are similar to the laptop uh, having a, 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 a problem with the battery or the power adapter. It's, it's, a, it's a laptop that all of a sudden goes blank. You're going to see Windows events, the regular ones, and then nothing, and then just a standard boot after. If it's a force restart attack, 
uh, you're going to have traces of the blue screen of death, the BSOD, the error codes, memory dumps, and so on. So if the attacker is sloppy, you're going to see those, and you're going to be able to say, hmm, yes, they used the test case from the phase dancer, and this is how they crashed it. Uh, because the attacker has access to the drive after the drive has been unlocked, uh, the attacker can clean up those traces, so it might be very difficult for you to detect that. What can you do to protect against this if you're using self-encrypting drives? Well, as a user, if you power off the machine or hibernate the laptop when it's not attended, uh, you're addressing a lot of the cases. You're protecting against 90% of the, of, of the, of the attacks, um, especially if when powering on the machine, the machine requires authentication. Um, if you're an IT administrator or you can influence the IT administrators, things that they can do are enable pre-boot authentication, and if you do that, your users are going to hate you, uh, but you're protecting them. Uh, you can disable sleep mode, and if you do this, your users are going to help uh, hate you even more, because now when they're closing the lid to the laptop, going to the other meeting room, and then they open the lid, the laptop will have to wake up from hibernation. It's going to take them two or three minutes, uh, and then they're not going to be happy. Um, and also another thing is you can disable automatic restarts uh, if the laptop crashes. For laptop manufacturers, they can actually implement features uh, which will power cycle a drive when the machine restarts, which is something that we see with the Lenovo drives uh, in the BitLocker eDrive mode. Um, and additionally, uh, laptops could detect that when the laptop was in sleep mode, I actually took the drive out, I connected some extension cables between, and then the drive's back, it's connected again to the machine. So they could detect this, and if that's the case, then they could power off the machine, for example, so that the machine doesn't automatically unlock the drive at that point. Uh, we went through a responsible disclosure process with the TCG, Trusted Computing Group, and they involved Lenovo, which is one of the manufacturers, and then they said, yeah, this detection of the drive tampering when it's in sleep mode sounds like a good idea, and they actually implemented a, a feature in BIOS that uh, can detect that and works at, as advertised. It's called internal storage tamper detection. There's one big problem with this. It only works if you enable it. Uh, and by default, it's disabled. <laughs> so finally, uh, the homework part is, if you're not sure what kind of encryption you have, uh, and you have, uh, it, it's, if it's probably BitLocker, run the commands that I show you, that I shown you. Uh, try to see uh, what kind it is. At least you're gonna know if it's software or hardware. Uh, if you don't have any encryption at all, then you have a whole lot of other problems that you have, have to deal with first. Um, if it's hardware encryption, then try to replicate one of these attacks. Uh, the SATA extension cable, that's five bucks on eBay. Uh, crashing the machine, even if you do it just that way, which doesn't require any specific hardware, you just need to set a registry key and then have a bootable Ubuntu uh, thumb drive, it just requires a, a, a bit of time on your part. So try to replicate one of these. These are pretty simple. At least you'll know, you'll understand better the limitations of this technology and uh, how it can be bypassed. And then, Take this information, take it back home if it's a personal computer and then harden the configuration based on what we've seen in the previous slide. Or if it's a corporate computer, take it back to your security group, to your IT group, talk to them about this, uh, let them know what the issues are and uh, tell them how they can improve it. Thank you, are there any questions? Software encryption uh, versus the hardware encryption, uh, it doesn't have these p p particular problems, but it has other problems. Uh, there's, there, there's things where you can take a drive, just modify uh, the pre-boot authentication software, put something else there, put it back on the drive, uh, put the machine back, and then wait for the user to log on, evil made attack, and even have something that sends you that password or data afterwards after the wire. Uh, there's reading the keys from memory if the laptop is powered on. Uh, there's a couple of other issues with software encryption. So uh, I wouldn't say there's one better than the other in terms of, of, of security. Um, if your laptop is on and you're leaving the laptop on unattended, regardless of whether you have software or hardware encryption, I would say you're exposing yourself to a risk that I wouldn't be able to tolerate. Uh, that being said, the hardware encryption has some advantages from a performance point of view and from the fact that it can just out of the, the, the box with a, uh, with a switch activate the encryption. Also, hardware encryption has a, it's a pretty nice uh, side effect is you can do a crypto wipe. You can change the key, the key encryption key in the drive. 
you can switch that to something else, and then the data will become inaccessible uh, on the drive. And that, you, you're basically wiping the drive entirely in, in a matter of a couple of seconds. If you are hibernating or powering off, the only way you can attack the machine uh, is if you have passed through pre-boot authentication. So if you have BitLocker with TPM only, so that then the machine powers on, unlocks the drive, and then you can use the same techniques. Just switch the drive at that point from the laptop to your attacker machine. If you power off or hibernate the drive and you have pre-boot authentication, either the BitLocker pin or the secure deck that I showed you in the, in the second demo, then there's not much the attacker can do. So if I've done anything similar with uh, uh, external drives that do hardware encryption, external drives are uh, work differently. And uh, each of the, if it's an external hard drive, like the Western Digital, they, they're pretty known for their, uh, they have a, a similar uh, software, uh, sorry, self-encrypting drive where the drive is actually encrypted and it's a, a processor on the drive that does that. Um, there's some pretty good research out there on vulnerabilities around that. Not around the standard, because they're not following any standard. There's it's something proprietary that they implemented. But just on the way the keys are being generated. And the fact that one of the, my key takeaways from that research was that the keys with which these drives are loaded from the factory are weak and are predictable based on the, on the date when the drive was produced. You can pretty much uh, predict that and decrypt those drives. Uh, there's other cases with, for example, some uh, USB thumb drives where when you plug in the thumb drive, you run a software and then that software sometimes appears as a CD, the amounts of virtual CD on your computer, uh, and you can run it and then it triggers something similar of locking and unlocking. Once again, that's all proprietary to that company and it just works with custom commands that they implemented. Um, a lot of the, those times, those vendors don't have the experience uh, and they, uh, they didn't get the chance to get it wrong and get the crypto wrong as many times as the big players like uh, Symantec or Microsoft or SecureDoc have. So I would say there's probably more chance on having uh, issues with those with the crypto part itself. It's just that you need to focus on those drives specifically. And if the market share is not large enough, uh, you might not have people that are, that are looking into it. Any other questions? Uh, if this techniques, technique works on uh, uh, RAID and on Windows Server 2012, in theory it should. In theory, this, this works on everything. This works on Mac, uh, it works on Linux, it works on, uh, there's a variety of software that can do uh, hardware-based encryption on, on these platforms. Um, I'm not sure if BitLocker supports eDrive, the, the hardware-based encryption mode, uh, if your drive is in a RAID configuration. Um, I know that the TCG have a, a variation of the standard. Instead of the, the TCG Opal, they have a TCG Opal Enterprise version, which is pretty similar. Um, and uh, from, from my understanding, and I haven't looked at those, it pretty much has the same issues. And the main uh, objective of the standard is to protect against disclosing data from the drive after the drive has been removed from the server and it's powered off. So you can easily take that drive and throw it away. You don't have to worry about wiping the drive after. Um, but the same techniques here would apply. So if you just take a Windows Server 2012 uh, with a single drive and activate this, then it's going to be exactly the same thing. It's, it's the same bit locker, the same, the same, the, exactly the same mechanisms. Some t you have some Windows Server 2012, sorry, with, a, with TPM and RAID 1? Yeah. And do you have BitLocker on them? Um, oh. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that uh, to be able to use the self-encrypting drives, you have to have secure boot on. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't play that nice with some RAID configuration. So you might not be able to set it up this way but definitely worth a try. Any other questions? Since it's seamless on the hardware, could you have a custom class table made so, and just ship it in there rather than doing like the dirty 
having the, the same kind of power? It seems like you did that and with the with the hardware owner to be a lot easier and cleaner and be getting you know with your your factory. So uh, what you're saying is have a sort of a shim and insert that and connect that. Uh, to the drive and then connect that to the hardware cloner, right? Yeah. Uh, you could, you, uh, so f uh, on the point of whether once you unlock the drive, whether you can connect that to the hardware cloner, that, and that's a good point that I didn't talk about, but definitely, once the drive's unlocked, uh, I connected it to a laptop here for the demos, but you could actually connect it to the cloner and do the imaging with the cloner. Um, if you just insert a shim, you would have to make sure that you're somehow disconnecting the SATA connection that the drive has with the laptop. So you'd have to insert a shim and then somehow remove the drive after at that point. It's definitely possible. The, my pins and the breaking the plastic is pretty messy and pretty ugly. It was mostly to see if, if it can be done. Uh, but yeah. Uh, but the, the price to me that's insulated on the one side, it should automatically turn it off, right? Even if you have the envelope, well, the, the envelope. Um, do the pins, do the connectors are just on one side on the top or on both sides? It, it might be that, I'm, I'm not sure how the SATA connector is, I can actually have, it's just the, the if it's just the one side, then yeah, you could insert the shim and then at that point uh, it, it would do that. You just have to make sure that when you're inserting the power shim, that you're maintaining power to the drive and then when that transition uh, is done between power being sent from the laptop versus power being sent from your shim, the drive doesn't lose its power, doesn't lose power for one instant, because if it does, then it's just gonna, uh, reset and, 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 and lose the encryption key from memory. Any other questions? Uh, the M.2 drives, uh, no, I haven't done that with the M.2 drives. Uh, and uh, if, if the, you should be able to do the same thing, it's just that the pinout is different than the SATA drives. Uh, but it's pretty much the same, the same idea. I, I, don't, I, I think this would work, and you would pretty much just have to have the connector where you're supplying power to the correct pins and then just extracting the data from there. And then you would have to connect it to an M.2 connector on the other side, of course. Any other questions? Thank you.